So my apologies. Um, so we'll just spend a few minutes here, and then we'll start walking up the, uh, the the deck here. So obviously, you folks have had an opportunity to look behind you, and you can see uh, our next patient, which is AV53. Uh, we're going to be launching the MMS satellite, which is scale mission for NASA on the 12th of March at about 10.44 in the evening. Uh, the nice thing about that particular configuration is if you look at it, it's the exact configuration of the Blue Origin Centaur that we will fly for GST-100. So that's a 421 uh, configuration, so it's got two SRVs and one RL-10 engine um, for the second stage. So um, again, the vast majority of our work occurs in the VIP where we integrate the stages, we'll integrate the spacecraft here next week. So um, on the 26th of, uh, of this month, the, the spacecraft will roll out. Typically, uh, two days before launch, we will roll the entire stack that you see behind us up to the pad. And what they told me they wanted me to start doing is, to, as we talk, to keep walking up the hill. So I'll try not to fall, and you guys try not to fall on top. And am I talking loud enough? Let's say you can hear me. Okay. So, so anyhow, the way our integrated stack works is obviously we've got several major components. So obviously you've got the rocket, the booster stage, the interstage of the the center stage, the hotel, and then the payload fare to the spacecraft. Um, the other major component is the MLP, the mobile launch platform. Then you have the GC Cube system, which is occupied, which is housed in the what we call the G van. Van. The payload van houses all of the customer's equipment. So once we start the, uh, the roll, the customer is in constant communication with their satellite during the entire roll. We have a fiber optic cable that actually is, is laying down inside the, the rail over there that provides that link between the spacecraft and our customer. Got about 400 pieces of outboard steel that'll make up the rest of the crew. How about crew escape? So, crew escape, good question. So, we will, we'll stop here for just a minute. Um, so, again, from the same level, which is level 12, and that's 174, about 172 feet, is where the crew escape system is. It's a slide wire basket system, very similar to shuttle, okay. except we've taken a lot of the lessons learned from shuttle and made some great improvements on, uh, on this system. And basically the egress system is about a 1,345 foot uh, slide wire basket trip to uh, what we call the Ready Building parking lot. And uh, that's just to the north, northeast of us from here. You said improvements, so like what? I mean, I'm familiar with so, the shuttle bath. So some of the improvements that we're making is for, for shuttle, it was basically a single rope that was gravity fed the whole way down. We are also gonna be gravity fed the whole way down. However, we're gonna have a, what they call a haul rope. And that haul rope is a continuous loop rope, which will allow us to 
use that rope for breaking purposes when we get closer to the bottom. The other thing that we're doing is we're taking some of the technologies that are used in gondolas. And, and so what we're going to do is we have to navigate over a, a, a guard shack. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually put a stanchion up with these fixed rails that the cables will roll over top of, and that will provide a fixed height. We're going to use that same technology down in the landing zone. So when the, the baskets get down the landing zone, they will be at a fixed height. So regardless of how much weight comes out, the baskets will stay at that height and not go up. A couple of other improvements that we're, we've done is, is rear entry. So instead of having to step into a basket or climb out, they'll basically walk in and walk out. Huh. So those are some of the improvements. And again, you know, we're able to capitalize on a lot of the great work that came out of you know, the space shuttle program and, uh, and incorporate it into some of our designs. How many baskets can you find? Four baskets. So, and the baskets will uh, be able to occupy up to five passengers. Wow, so, so a total of 20. So you evacuate the entire pad that way. You know, well, why you need that. we're going to have a very small number of people out here during our load. So we'll have a space shuttle, it'll be a fully tanked vehicle, it's going to be a, a very small group of people, probably 13, 14 people tops. Any other questions? We'll let reporters go down there to test it out. <laughs> we are going to try to recover costs, we will sell ride tickets. <laughs> For those people that remember Disney, it will be an e-ticket ride. Are there references to being the first tower of its type built in uh, many, many years? I mean, would, would that be uh, one of KSC? No, we, we looked yeah. only at shuttle, unfortunately. Yeah, that was about the only data point that we could use in regards to the way the arm was structured, the white room. And again, we tried to capitalize on what knowledge, you know, that the former engineers were able to create, and then we uh, built off of that. Is the cost of the project part of the overall commercial crew contract and can separate out the costs? It, it is part of it, but I, I'm not at liberty to, to really talk about cost, ma'am. But, but yeah, it's it's all part of the, the overall program that we're on contract to Boeing for. So, um, I assume you do the same to some launch a rocket and you're flying commercial missions as well. I mean, at that point, are there, I know you don't want to talk about funding, but like if you're flying a, a, a big one habitat or something um, with the operation or anything at the time, you're going to do We're hoping not. We're, so right now, our, our plan is to still maintain you know our successes so what's been working for for the atlas program we continue to capitalize on on those means of operations you know we are making other improvements <coughs> to the rocket so obviously we're going with the dual engine centaur that's not for redund redundancy sake but um it provides us that extra <coughs> little, uh, impulse to get to, to station uh, we're also incorporating an emergency uh, detection system which will provide on board help the vehicle in real time and in the event something is misbehaving, it'll provide the necessary feedback to CST-100 to uh, eject as required. But uh, but from an operations perspective, we are building off of what has worked very well for, for this program over the last many years. And uh, we've been working closely with our Boeing counterparts, because obviously there are some, some differences. You know, we're dealing with, with, with humans at this point, and not a, a tangible piece of hardware. And so we are taking all those aspects into consideration. Uh, all the human safety factors are for designs for the tower, so we we believe we, we've done a really good job up to this point and um, uh, providing a very safe and reliable <coughs> launch system and also a uh, crew access tower for, for the crew. So then, um, the Economic Development Council uh, of the Space Council. Thank you guys very much for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to thank Howard for uh, for a wonderful tour of the construction progress uh, here at LC41. Uh, it really is unique, uh, the way that uh, ULA is, is conducting all of the pattern modifications here uh, in the middle of one of the busiest manifests uh, any pad in the space uh, So thank you, Howard. Uh, the Atlas V, uh, with its unrivaled technical and scheduled reliability, is the obvious choice uh, for a commercial crew launch vehicle. Uh, right now, we've, we've had 52 successful launches, 100% mission success, and we're really excited that Flight 73 
uh, is going to have a CST100 capsule. Uh, so thank you very much. It truly is an integrated effort here with all of our teammates and partners. Uh, and we want to thank them for all the progress that we've made and, and for the work that's in front of us uh, on this historic journey. Uh, so thank you guys very much. I'd like to introduce Jim Sponnick to say a few words. Thank you, John. And on behalf of United Launch Alliance, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today is actually a very important date in space history. It was 53 years ago today that John Glenn was the first American to orbit the Earth, launching on an Atlas rocket just a few miles from here. And I tell you, we are thrilled to be collaborating with the Boeing Company and with NASA to be continuing that legacy and to be uh, returning America to, to launching astronauts to the space station. As John indicated, we have a, a terrific plan to be building this crew access tower over the next 18 months. In that same time frame, we'll be launching a dozen missions, and uh, we've got a great plan that's going to accommodate the production of that, uh, that crew access tower and the, and the crew platform to access the CST-100 to enable these critical launches. Thank you all for being here today. All right, and Bob again. Thanks, John. I, I debated uh, whether or not I'd wear my uh, NASA flight jacket out here. I thought maybe I could wangle my way onto the test flight with Fergie, but I, I decided, you know. Uh, today is an historic event. Uh, it's just one more piece of tangible. It's just one more piece of tangible evidence of the progress that we're making here at KSC, uh, moving into the future, transitioning to what we're going to be, and that's that multi-user spaceport for government and commercial operations to and from low Earth orbit and beyond. Uh, this is an historic pad. It's launched a number of uh, NASA scientific missions, the Voyager, Pluto New Horizons, the Curiosity rover on Mars, and now it's going to launch an even more uh, valuable, precious piece of cargo, and that's NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased with the partnerships that we have and the progress that we're making. Uh, it was pointed out in our discussions earlier, you know, pretty soon uh, we hope to have three pads here at KSC launching humans to space. 41 with the Atlas CST-100, uh, 39A with the Falcon 9 and the Dragon Rider, and uh, 39B with uh, Orion on the SLS. And that's a pretty amazing future that we got coming. So we're going to continue to explore, we're going to continue to move forward, we're going to continue to be commercially friendly, enabling commercial operations, and I can't wait to, to see this tower erected and an Atlas V up there with a CST-100 headed off to the International Space Station. Thanks. And this way, please. Thank you. Have 13 feet to go, and we'll be at where we have to go. <laughs> 13 feet down? No. Place to go, but uh, you know, to, to go from the old stop to.
you may just picture yourself yeah. uh, just going to get an elevator right here is, uh, is just, just some kind of progress, I guess. Well, you know, it's uh, what has it been about three and a half years, you know, going on four years this July. It's about time we get you know, we take the business back. Uh, I think we're, we're ready for it. We have the first pieces of, uh, of the CST 100, uh, the structural test cars that showed up over in OPF3, the former OPF3, which is now our processing facility, you know, that's been uh, gutted and renovated on the inside. Uh, the OPF portion is coming, that, that work begins this December. Uh, Boeing will eventually move our office spaces in here, so, you know, it's pretty clear between us and then across the aisle, the X-37 operation that uh, we're going to stay for a while. And, uh, you know, the, uh, just as it, at the end of the shuttle program, I think, sort of represented a pretty significant slowdown for the, for the Space Coast area. And I think we're we're about on the other side of the bathtub curve right now. You know, we're, we're heading back up and seeing some tangible evidence that, uh, that human space flights come back to the Space Coast. And, you know, we're scheduled to do it in just a couple short years. It's our belief. And when, when do you plan to name a crew for uh, your first yeah. I think, um, you know, the uh, I think the target is sometime this summer. Um, you know, again, I, I've got to confirm that with John and John Elbon. But the idea is that uh, there's a couple of what we're calling PCMs. Actually, it's not our name. It's the commercial program's name. Uh, post-certification mission. So, uh, you know, if you look at the way the contract is worked, they're scheduled to be awarded sometime this summer. So we thought, you know, if, uh, with that announcement, it might be a good idea to, to roll out the idea of the name and the crew. And, uh, visible elements of the program that people are appreciating. Uh, for, uh, yeah, for Boeing's operation, it would be one NASA, one Boeing is where the plans are right now. You can try to put those words on, on the program. Well, right but that, does, that doesn't mean Boeing couldn't hire another. <laughs> Program. Let's put it that way. And, and that, that decision is ultimately Boeing and John Holland. And we'll wait and see how that all works out. You know, I, I'd be honored to be asked, but we have to just wait and see how it all works out. Yeah, sure, of course. No, I mean, uh, again, I, I just was, didn't know if I'd forgotten any other astronauts you might have on, on there, the team. No, but, there um, are actually point. there are actually none. You know, Brewster Shaw left uh, you know, left as the VP about uh, about a year and a half ago. So it's it's all me right now. It's great. You know, it's uh, I'm gonna say it's nice to be the only one around. But we, you know, we got an opportunity. What, what I really enjoyed doing, and I joined the Boeing team about three years ago, was getting on the ground floor of building a spaceship. And we haven't done this in this country in 40 years to build a human qualified spaceship. And here, here was a, a wonderful opportunity to get in with a, a team that was small and very nimble and, and put the whole thing together. And we did that in a, in a period of about six months. You know, we designed the entire crew interface, uh, all the displays, the whole ops concept of how the crew will interact with the vehicle. And now, two years later, we're actually seeing all that become we're actually getting ready to build flight hardware you know, as far as the consoles are concerned. We're seeing the first uh, iterations of the flight software begin to come out. And now, uh, you know, how the first flight software drives it off. And it really drives out the first time. So now we're seeing the tangible evidence of our efforts for a couple of years ago. It was really good. And have you actually relocated out here as well in addition to John, or is that in the future? No, I'm actually out here. I uh, moved out here in early December for uh, a temporary two year assignment. So okay. we'll, we'll where, see. Where do you call home? Um, I'm living out on the beach. I really like it. I love Cocoa Beach. But, you know, I always love coming out here. Always remind me of space flight. So uh, I thought it was pretty nice to come out here and have an opportunity to live with my wife again, which, which is really good. <laughs> so uh, we live down uh, just the north part of Cocoa Beach. I get a chance to walk out in the morning and watch the launches, and that's sort of a cool feeling. You're still entitled to, to stroll through your crew quarters anytime you want to? Or? I stop up there because uh, I have a good friend that works up there, and she still lets me in the door. But <laughs> my key doesn't work anymore. Uh, but we, you know, so part of our operation is to borrow uh, yeah. some of the NASA yeah. infrastructure that's existed here for 50 years that supports crew operations. We will be using the, the crew quarters, that's what NASA told us to do. And then there's you know, there's other supporting facilities that will probably uh, make uh, you know, arrangements and agreements to, to go ahead and use the crew quarters. Right down the road, right here. So uh, yeah, it's kind of like having an old friend again. So stay tuned. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot to There's certainly a lot to come. Okay.
Can you take us through a mission profile for CST-100? Sure. Um, you know, keeping it very top level, you know, our idea is to uh, is stock quickly. So I think you'll find that uh, most of our plans, uh, at least our, our day one target, will be the launch and, uh, and dock quickly, uh, you know, within the cruise, cruise day allowance. But that said, you know, we have the ability to dock on the second day or even the third. Um, and then NASA uh, calls for the mission to stay docked for uh, up to 210 days to support the crew. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll undock and return to one of, uh, one of several uh, West Coast landing sites. Uh, we land on land, uh, so uh, uh, there's a parachute landing you know, followed by an airbag and the final descent. And then uh, we re reuse the vehicle, so we'll, uh, we'll get the NASA crew out and send them back home. And, and then we'll, we'll process the, the, the the top end of CST-100 uh, back here in the facility in, in, in CP, uh, C3 uh, and then we have a couple of months, probably that same vehicle six months later. We are the only ones currently planning um, the land on land. You know, the, the competition I think has some designs to do that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what, what they'll be doing or when they're going to try it, but I know that ultimately they would like to land. But right now, of course, uh, you know, their cargo would like to go. You're going to be watching these EVAs coming up closely yeah. at all, considering they're kind of related. Uh, yeah, they're actually going to let a couple pilots do an EVA, which is scary. <laughs> For the longest time, the admission specialist told us that only they were qualified to do EVAs. So we're looking forward to seeing a couple pilots go in there. I heard it was delayed by a day. They had it. Uh, yeah, they, I think they saw something in one of the EMUs that were sent back that they, they wanted to take a closer look at before they were uh, so, uh, yeah, tomorrow I think is the first one of two, right? Two or three, maybe. Yeah, two or three the series, yeah. Probably should read up a little bit. I'm not even sure what their tasks are. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of cables today. It's all related to the IDAs going on. Yeah. Well, of course, the IDAs, uh, you know, support the new, uh, you know, support the new NASA docking system, uh, the NDS, uh, and, uh, which is a yeah, sort of cool if you think about it. I mean, you know, people ask me what the ISS sort of meant to me, and it, you know, it means we, as a global community, sort of speak similar languages in terms of interfaces in space. Uh, and, and this is sort of the culmination of it, where there's now an international docking standard that anyone can sort of, if they, part, you know, if they, if they participate in, in, the, in the standards, you know, they can change the vehicles in space. So it, it, that's a, it's a great, great concept. Of course, uh, they're going to expand the docking ports on the International Space Station too. Uh, formerly shuttle uh, only docked to the No. 2 forward port. They're going to open up the No. 2 Zenith port. So it'll become somewhat like the mirror image of the Russian segment, where you have vehicles that can dock uh, to the rear and to the bottom. We're going to be on the front and on the top. So, uh, you know, the Whenever you're like ready, it. if you can explain your name, your okay. role, and... Jim Spodek, Vice President of Atlas and Delta Programs for ULA. This is the model of the crew access tower. The actual tower will be 200 feet tall. There'll be an elevator running the entire length of the crew access tower, and then the platform that the crew will use to access the CST-100 uh, capsule itself. That uh, that platform will coast will rotate away from the rocket to the launch, and uh, features like that built in, including an emergency egress system, a cable system, operating a, uh, a safety egress uh, vehicle well away from the launch pad, should that be necessary. We'll be building the core access tower over the next year and a half, and at the same time launching about a dozen vehicles from this launch pad. So, um, the CST-100 right now is purely for ISS. Do you have any other aims with the module? So, so the Boeing company is building the, uh, the CST-100. So how many times can it actually be reused? We have to ask the, the Boeing team that the reuse of the, of the capsule itself would we'll provide the launch service for it, and, uh, together with our many other launches from this launch pad each year. So how much has there been required to adapt the Atlas from its normal commercial purposes to the manned? So by far the biggest thing at the launch site, of course, is the, is the 
access tower itself. For the rocket itself, uh, the primary modifications are the addition of an emergency detection system as monitoring the health of the rocket during the flight. Should there should it detect that there's something going awry, an anomaly occurring on the launch, uh, launch vehicle itself, it quickly sends a vehicle to the capsule and allows it to safely escape away from the launch vehicle. That's really the primary modification to the to launch vehicle to accommodate launching out. Okay, and you mentioned earlier, obviously, this is a very significant milestone in respect of a historic event. Could you re, uh, basically explain the history between Atlas from the past to the present? Certainly. Uh, actually, the first American astronaut to, to launch into orbit, of course, John Glenn being the first, uh, launched uh, on this date in history 53 years ago, uh, 20th of February. emergency detection system to enable the uh, Freedom 7 capsule to be able to separate. So that was 53 years ago and now uh, that legacy is continuing with the CST-100 launching on the, the modern day Atlas V rocket. Okay, um, could you just do one final, I'm with Zero G News, if you could say your name and welcome to Zero G News. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, my name is Jim Sponick, the United Launch Alliance. Boeing will much. add to the skyline at Cape Canaveral during the next couple of years with the construction of a 200-foot-tall crew access tower. The structure will be the first of its kind to be built at the Florida spaceport since the 1960s. It is needed to allow astronauts and support staff to safely board and prep the Boeing CST-100 for crewed missions to the International Space Station. United Launch Alliance, which operates the launch pad, will oversee the 18-month construction work. The work will take place between Atlas V launches as the pad remains operational. This is a modular design, so all of the superstructure will be built off-site. Uh, those superstructures would then be trucked in and uh, erected on the pad on a non-interfering basis. The crew access tower will feature an elevator, 42-foot long access arm, an environmentally controlled white room akin to the one astronauts pass through to board the space shuttle. So human safety is the number one uh, aspect to our design. So all elements of our design are taken into consideration the, the human safety aspects of both the flight crew and the ground crew. The tower will be in place in time for Boeing to begin its flight test regimen, including one in 2017 with a test pilot and astronaut on board. is housed in the, what we call the G-Van. Then we have the P-Van, which is the payload van. The payload van houses all of the customer's equipment. So once we start, so my apologies. Um, so we'll just spend a few minutes here and then we'll start walking up the, uh, the, the deck here. So obviously you folks have had an opportunity to look behind you and you can see uh, our next mission, which is AV-53. Uh, we're going to be launching the MMS satellite, which is the scale mission for NASA on the 12th of March at about 10.44 in the evening. Uh, the nice thing about that particular configuration is if you look at it, it's the exact configuration that we went to Centaur that we would fly for CST-100. So that's a 421 uh, configuration, so it's got two SRVs and one RL-10 engine uh, for the second stage. So um, again, the vast majority of our work occurs in the VIP where we integrate the stages, we'll integrate the spacecraft here next week. So uh, on the 26th of, uh, of this month, the, the spacecraft will roll out. Typically, uh, two days before launch, we will roll the entire stack that you see behind us up to the pad. And what they told me they wanted me to start doing is, as we talk, to keep walking up the hill. So I'll try not to fall, and you guys try not to fall on top of me. And am I talking loud enough? Let's say you can hear me. 
customer is in constant communication with their satellite during the entire roll. We have a fiber optic cable that actually is, is laying down inside the, the rail over there that provides that link between the spacecraft and our customer. Access to CST 100. That arm is about 170 feet off the ground and about 42 foot. 